Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. This is an interview on how the sustainable clothing giant Patagonia is investing in organic regenerative agriculture and food. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! So welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture. I'm here today with Phil Graves at the Patagonia headquarters and Thin Shed Ventures very excited to hear more about their work in regenerative agriculture and food and what's next for them. So welcome, Phil. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And to start with a personal question, what brings you into the space? Why soil? Why region egg and food? Well, soil is key to our future. I uh, started my career working with a global consulting firm, and I realized that we spend so much of our lives at work decoupling your craft from your personal values and interest is something that um, really bothered me. And so that's what led me to Patagonia and Tinch Adventures. And then now when we look at some of our most intractable environmental problems that we face with the, with the climate crisis going on right now, soil for us seems like our most compelling solution to help mitigate some of these problems like global warming. And with our food business, we make and sell apparel and we've done that for nearly 50 years. You eat every day. And for us, that's one of the key reasons we launched Patagonia Provisions, our in-house food business, why we have Tin Shed Ventures, our investment arm where we can fund regenerative ag and scale this movement. And that's what gets me excited each and every day to come to work and make the world a better place for my three young daughters. And when you look at the regenerative ag and food movement, we were talking about it before, before before I started recording. It seems like we're having a moment and we're having a moment in the movement. What excites you the most at the moment when you look at uh, region ag and food? Well, for, for me, the data has been compelling for a long time where you look at chemical ag, industrial ag, um, conventional ag. I prefer chemical ag just to call it what it is. There have been decades long studies, agricultural health studies that show that the incidence of cancer rates for farmers, the health of the soil, All of these things, the taste, nutrition, are deteriorating at a rapid rate. Our health and the food that we eat is is literally killing us. So uh, it's been very refreshing to see some of these studies come to light. They've been buried in academic papers for a long time, but you're starting to see the movement with Roundup being banned and and Germany, uh, Bears Backyard. That was a headline I'd love to see a couple weeks back. And um, of course, you, you can identify a problem, but that's not going to help anything if you don't identify a solution. And now with the spotlight being on regenerative or organic agriculture, it's something that Patagonia is keenly interested right in right now. We help develop a new certification called Regenerative Organic Certification, which, uh, of course, being tied to organic, it doesn't use harmful chemicals, but goes uh, broader than that to encompass compassion to the workers that are key to the farmer's supply chain, um, compassion to the animals to ensure that they're treated with dignity and respect. And then importantly, the soil itself too. So not just uh, avoiding chemicals, which of course is a great first step, but looking at uh, tilling practices and cover crops and crop rotations, actually building 
healthy soil that can sequester carbon and be one of our best shots at tackling global warming. And when you look at what you've done so far, you've been setting up a food brand, the Patagonia Provisions, which I will definitely link below because you have a lot of amazing videos and stories to really explain the ingredients in, uh, in that brand. You've set up a new certification scheme. Um, what's next for Patagonia when it comes to, of course, what you can share? What's next for Patagonia when it comes to Antinche Adventures, when it comes to Regen Food and Egg? What's mostly most exciting for you at the moment? We're talking October 2019. I'm, uh, I'm proud at what we've done thus far with provisions and tin shed, but I really feel like we've just laid the foundation at this point. We've got a lot of great stories out there, whether it's uh, Kearns of beer. Kearns is a perennial grain that is a great alternative to annual wheat. It's got a deep root system that needs less water, fewer nutrients, and is a, ter a terrific regenerative crop. Uh, that's one example. We've invested in a buffalo company that's restoring the, the Great Plains of South Dakota They make a delicious, delicious product. We're selling buffalo jerky through Patagonia Provisions, our food arm. And then the most important part is the Great Plains ecosystem and the soil health and bringing bison back to the prairie. And that for us has been a great example to show that you can bring these products to market and build regenerative food supply chains. But if we stop there, we failed. We've got to get these practices to scale. And that's where We're delighted to see some conversations that are actually resulting in action with some of the bigger food companies adopting Kernza. Some of the biggest bison herds in, in the land are looking at wild idea over the fence, literally, and saying, hey, we like this practice of raising the bison on the prairie and, and harvesting them on the prairie. So there's no grain that's fed to them their entire life because that's how they were designed to be for thousands of years. So It's something that, uh, to, to say it succinctly, we're looking to scale these practices over the next five years. And when it comes to investing, what do you see the role of Tinch Adventures in that? How do you see the, the role of an investment fund, a long-term investment fund, but still an investment fund in the regenerative food and, and egg space? The key word you mentioned there is, is long-term. Um, when you transition to organic, as many farmers uh, are painfully aware, it, it takes some time. It, it's a three-year process to convert. Whenever you flip from conventional, your soil is dead. It's been, it's been uh, growing crops on these synthetic harmful inputs, and the intent in chemical ag is to sterilize the soil. So out of the gate, you're going to have lower yields. You're going to not realize the organic premium. And it's a really difficult place to be in financially when you're trying to put food on your family's table, literally and figuratively. So uh, for the investors that want to come to the table and fund this transition to regenerative ag from chemical ag, having that, uh, that patient capital mindset, taking a long-term view of uh, the fact that this is a broken food system that we're trying to fix. And to fix it, it's going to take time. You have to understand that it's not simply just buying seed, working the tractor, and then harvesting your monocrop. You're going to have to be really thoughtful about the crops that you play, what region are you in, what climate are you in. And now with global warming getting worse and worse every day, you're going to have to deal with extreme weather events too. So it's, it's finding the right creative farmers, problem solvers, giving them the capital to do great things And then stepping back and not demanding, hey, what was our financial return last quarter? What's our, what's our net income last quarter? Uh, that's been our approach with Tinch Adventures. We don't ask for financials on a quarterly basis. We target entrepreneurs doing the right things in regenerative organic ag and renewable energy and um, the apparel side on innovations that can help us build the best product with the least environmental harm. We equip, equip them and what they need in terms of resources, and then we let them do the great things. So we don't check in. And what we've seen as a result of that is on the venture side, we have 100% survival rate, knock on wood, and that, that continues. The return on invested capital is, is quite good. We're proud of that as well. And it's because we have that long-term view. The, uh, the Chenards and Rose, the Chenards are, are of, course, of course our founders and Rose is our CEO. They, um, they don't demand to know how's the, f the fund doing financially. It's how do we save our home planet. That's the mission. And by doing that, taking that long-term view, you're able to have that strong financial returns. And I would encourage others uh, to, to take a similar mindset when they deploy capital. And I don't know if this, is, um, if this has happened actually, but have you invested in farmers specifically, apart from the bison maybe, and how has that been through that transition as, as a fund, which probably was set up 
more on the private equity side. Have you been flexible there? What, what have you seen in terms of your interaction directly with uh, financing farmers, which is something that comes back to, to this show. Very often I hope to do a, a transition finance series specifically on farmers. So I'm very curious about your, your interaction with farmers directly. Again, the key is is uh, direct. There, that, that each time you, you give me a good word to latch on to, you have to have a direct connection with the farmers. That's what we found has been the best. So when we uh, bring regenerative organic grains to market, buckwheat, for example, we actually go to the source. We meet the farmers. We shake their hand. We look them in the eye. We see the practices that they're doing, and then we hear what their pain points are. So another example where we've deployed capital to help enable this supply chain and build it from scratch in some cases is. For the buckwheat that we're using with the Patagonia Provision soups, we learned that the flour mills in the U.S. are solely concentrated on, on, uh, on annual wheat, and they don't have the ability to process any kind of ancient or specialized grains. And we had to, to get the product launched, ship it to Asia for processing. And then, of course, from a carbon standpoint, that doesn't make any sense. And then when you Quality dig in... Quality probably as well. Uh, absolutely. Then, you, then you, um, you look into the facts where we used to have thousands of local flour mills in the U.S. that can process, process specialized grains. With the industrial ag system where everyone's growing corn, wheat, and soy using Monsanto seed, those, those infrastructure pieces didn't exist anymore. So we literally funded a flour mill from scratch, and they built a flour mill that can process local regenerative grains like buckwheat and bring them to market through Patagonia Provisions. It's probably something you, you didn't think you would fund when you said, let's do a number of soups, and then you went into buckwheat, and then you went into mills. But it's probably also the exciting part of, of being an, an investor in regenerative food and agriculture. It's, it's all connected, meaning that we have to completely rebuild the infrastructure, um, probably a lot more in grain and meat, etc., because most of that has been completely centralized. Also, actually, on the seed side, when you look at other investors in the space, what would you see, because you have a very free role and a lot of uh, flexibility to do things, what would you say for others, let's say outside this, uh, this building, what are the main barriers for them to, to become more active? Because I see a lot of them are very interested. They, they start to see food and ag as a, an absolutely key part if you're interested in healthcare, education, um, inequality, climate, obviously water. But still, I don't see a lot of them actually moving into the space and being as flexible as you. What would you see? What is the biggest barrier for them to be to be really joining you in, in this uh, in this wave that you've been creating? You can join the movement apart from Patagonia. Uh, one of the things I'd encourage people to do is if you're working for a, a large food company that may say they'd like to move to regenerative, but you just haven't seen the follow through and the action steps is to create a clear case for why we should do that. I think you can look towards uh, younger people and how they purchase food and clothing and, and every product. They want to ensure that it's made responsibly. They want to ensure that it's on the apparel side, a durable good. And for food, they don't solely care about price. They want to know how nutritious is this for me and how was the farmer treated in the entire process? How was the soil treated? And showing that business case and that you can see it uh, manifest through large traditional food companies buying smaller brands that are trying to do things the right way you can, you can make that change within. And uh, again, I would encourage those trying to, to shift their organizations to regenerative and organic ingredients and food to take the long-term view. This is something that on a quarterly basis might not pencil out. In fact, um, our founder, Yvon Chouinard, has said every time he makes a decision for the planet, it ends up making him money. But what he doesn't say is it may not be that next quarter. It's over the long term. It's the cumulative effect. And I think taking the long-term view, looking at uh, building relationships with farmers and having long-term partnerships instead of a, a simple transactional relationship, that's key. And then uh, on the flip side, showing the business case that consumers are clearly moving towards this in their purchasing habits. And if you are known as a brand that does things the right way, you build supply chains if they don't exist and get these regenerative and organic products to market, those are the brands that are going to succeed in the future. And in fact, those may be the only brands that survive in the future. And you mentioned consumers. Do you see, I mean, you're on the very much on the consumer side of things and on the producer side of things. So you're, do you see that growing interest? Because we, we, I think many people in the bubble obviously understand region egg, understand region food, understand soil. But do you see the, a growing interest from um, the, the average consumer into something beyond organic or into something that really goes further in terms of, of soil building. 
I do. I, I think before I dive into the response, it's important to say how critical organic is to the foundation of regenerative, even if it's not certified. But the organic movement, while imperfect, it has uh, made a lot of strides in the industry. And if you look at the premiums that customers are willing to pay for organic, even if they don't fully understand it, that you know that helps with the business case and funding the transition too. And for us, being paired with organic at Patagonia as a company that's used organic cotton exclusively since 1996 and all of our products, it's something we're really passionate about. So I, I definitely want to just as a foundation lay the, t- the, the table for organic as, um, as a starting point. But then beyond that, um, building on organic of the foundation, the good foundation, the solid foundation of organic is also really important too. We've done a lot of surveys with customers as we're looking to further the regenerative organic movement and ensure the rock certification scales well and they care about these things we've done uh, customer focus groups across the country so not just patagonia customers or dr bronner's customers the types who would logically care about these types of products and demand it but uh, all over the country and the universal feedback is that they care and they want to have a comprehensive certification and and ag that doesn't use chemicals where the animals are treated with respect and the farmers and the farm workers are also treated fairly. Uh, These things matter. The word regenerative doesn't really matter to them. And I think we just have to use some really smart marketing and communication folks to help convey what we're doing to those customers because these are the type of products they want. No, that's very encouraging. And we probably, yeah, we, we need some great marketing people to to figure out soil building or something that, that immediately that touches us much more. To come back to the organic discussion, what would you say, because I was just at a conference in Oakland on investing in region food systems, and there was a lot of discussion around organic, as we've heard the, the I would say even say horror stories of industrial organic plowing like there's no, no tomorrow, basically just swiping one chemical for, an, an, let's say, an organic chemical. And that's one of the reasons why organic probably has a bad rep and is not financed through green bonds because of uh, actually a lot of carbon, a a lot of um, habits in terms of of workers, et cetera, that we don't want to. What would you say to a farmer that has been greatly reducing their their chemicals, but is at that limit of of cash flow, et cetera, and cannot make that jump yet? Is it absolutely essential to go organic first? Is there another route basically around and arrive at regenerative as well? Or is that really a first step you have to to step to organic before you go to step two or three or four in terms of, of regen? Yeah, fair question. I think organic at its core is a great starting point. The premiums I mentioned a few minutes ago, those are real. I mean, my, my background is in finance and I'm a CPA and you can't deny the fact that you can charge more for organic food. Now, as um, newspaper headlines are increasingly showing, you can have bad actors in organic and you can have fraud in organic where you're buying Uh, some organic products at Whole Foods, and it may not be actually organic, and there's just a paperwork scheme. Uh, So that integrity of organic is is incredibly important. And for us, um, you have to look at everything. That's why we built this comprehensive three-pillared standard rock, where it, it takes into account soil health, it takes into account animal welfare, and it takes into account social justice at the farm level. We think moving a step in any of those pillars forward towards um the high bar, whatever you want to call it, if it's rock or regenerative organic without being certified, that's fine. But we think we should take stock of where we are with our food system, acknowledge that it's broken, and then encourage others to make steps. Uh, We personally feel strongly about organic, but uh, encourage people to look at what regenerative practices you you can begin with. Look at using as few chemicals as possible with a very short term goal to use no chemicals because we feel like as you can see in the uh, the beautiful film by our friends at Apricot Lane Farm called The Biggest Little Farm, you can work with nature and have a farming and ranching operation that's in harmony with nature and use nature without paying anything to Monsanto for synthetic inputs to have solid yields, delicious food and build a great brand and a viable business from. I think it's an excellent point. It will be a discussion we're going to have, I feel, many, many times as we have to explain soil building. Um, but it's something we need to keep coming back to. I, I want to end with a, a few questions I, I always like to ask. Let's imagine there's, we're in a conference room here, but let's imagine there's a theater full of, of impact investors. They've read the books, they've been to the biggest little farm. Um, what would be your advice, obviously without giving investment advice, to get started? Because they haven't made their first investment yet. They haven't 
um, built or bought any farm, they haven't invested in a farm, they haven't made any investment in the food and egg space yet, where would you suggest them to, let's say, start looking? I'd say go direct and local if you can. I mean, I think the local food movement is important, but also we have to acknowledge that regional practices matter and, and wine in certain regions is better than wine in other regions, uh, just to put it in kind of fun terms. But local is easy. So if you look in terms of talking to a farmer in, in your area and understand where are their specific pain, pain points. If they're already organic, how do they move to regenerative organic? If they're a conventional farmer that's spraying chemicals every day, ask them how their financial situation is. And my guess is it's pretty bleak. It's all over the Wall Street Journal about how small and mid-sized farms are folding right and left. They're going bankrupt. And the only ones that are surviving are the mega farms. And even they are not doing as well financially. So uh, understand what the farmer's needs are and see if, if you can deploy capital in a way that can help get them on the journey or on the road to regenerative organic. And in terms of your work at the moment at Tinch Adventures and, and Patagonia Provisions, what are you most excited about what you can share, let's say what you're working on for the next few months, let's say until the end of the year, or, or if we speak next year, at the same time, what would you look back on and what really uh, excited you again, obviously, if you can share? Absolutely. Rock, as I've talked throughout the interview, is something that is um, our highest priority right now. There's a lot of science that affirms that regenerative and organic farming and ranching can sequester carbon in the soil. And with Climate Week happening, with young people and old people getting out in the streets and demanding action, pointing to solutions as a, uh, a key next step. And regenerative ag, we think, is, again, so important to build that healthy soil. Uh, rock is imperfect. It's in the pilot phase right now. We're learning so much through the public comment period we had last year through the pilots that are happening across the world now too. We are most excited about making rock successful, raising our game in our own supply chain with cotton and with our ingredients for Patagonia provisions being sourced in South America, being regenerative organic certified here in the near future. And then again, we don't want these things to just be a, a Patagonia innovation where we make great environmentally responsible products tied to rock and that's where it lives. We want the big food companies to know General Mills, you name it, to take a look at Rock and maybe launch it with one product line, do an experiment, see how the customers react to that. My guess is it's going to be a good step where you're going to take many steps after that. And would you consider that as a success next year, let's say we talk in October 2020, that at least one or two of these major food companies have, um, have launched a single line of, of Rock products? Is that what you can consider a success or is there something else you're targeting or measuring, let's say, a year from now? We want rock to be everywhere on every grocery store across the world. Now, that's an ambitious long term goal. I think uh, a successful launch with some lines and, and sub brands within some of the big food companies and seeing how those do, proving them successful, making it a scalable model for the farmer financially. Because, again, if it works for Patagonia and Danone, but the farmer is is not uh, doing well financially, that is not a viable model. So we want to ensure that we can set this up to minimize costs without compromising on the integrity of the certification, be successful with launches to the pilot, and then have this take hold and see traction where it takes over entire businesses of billion-dollar conglomerates. And, of course, the little brands, too. We feel, feel like um, the future is bright for smaller brands that are willing to do things the right way, and we want to support them as well as the big companies as they transition to regenerative and organic if you could wave a magic wand and tomorrow morning we wake up and Phil has changed something, you could choose anything. What would that be in terms of food and egg? Well, moving away from chemicals would be the easiest thing too. And I think that's the, the clearest first step. I'm a native Texan. And one of the things that I, I, I see all the time is when my friends have kids, they may not have eaten organic food previously, but they don't want to feed their baby pesticides. And they may not vote the same way as, as we do in California. They may not do everything the exact same way, but they care about the human health aspect. And when you look at organic and regenerative organic, that um, chemical-free aspect is really compelling to people. So I would love to wave the magic wand and get rid of, of, of Roundup and glyphosate and any other harmful chemicals that are used in, in industrial ag. And then, of course, you know, I'd love to think bigger than that, too, and beyond just eliminating the chemicals in ag, moving to regenerative and building that healthy soil and sequestering carbon and using that as a solution to fight climate change. And 
as a final question, I always say final question, and I come up with two or three more. Um, what do you believe to be true in regenerative ag, what others don't? And I borrowed this question from John Kemp, and he always asks us on modern agriculture, but I like to ask it on, on regen ag. So what do you believe to be true on regen ag that others don't agree with? Well, unsurprisingly, I think the fact that organic should be paired with regenerative is, is important. Again, whether it's ultimately certified or not, I think certification is one tool. But if you know your farmer and you source to them at the local market and you visit their operations, for example, I could go buy from Apricot Lane Farms and they don't have a certification. And I'm good with that because I know John and Molly personally and I don't need to have that certification. That may not be the reality for most people, especially if you live in, in a city. So certifications do play a key role. And I think the fact that organic is paired with regenerative and the rock certification is, is incredibly important. And I'd encourage one of the big you know, personal things that I have is that we can't look at regenerative in a silo. There are some organizations that say, like, like, let's only till less or let's reduce chemicals. And there's other initiatives and I won't name them and throw stones right now. And I think moving a step is good. But with the state of the climate crisis, things are great, really grave right now. And we have to go big and take a comprehensive approach and look at every tool in our toolbox for regenerative ag, organic ag broadly, and make solid progress on them. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. We saw it actually again and again with, with the presentation of David Montgomery in, uh, in Oakland. And as he always says, it, it's very easy for farmers to, to stop tilling for a few years and then say, oh, this regenerative ag thing doesn't work. And, and unless you do the four or five principles, uh, depends a bit who you talk to, um, but y it doesn't really work and it takes time. So it takes, a, I think we lose quite a few that are doing two of the three or, or three of the four and then a few years only down the line and say, this doesn't work. And they get invaded by pests like the biggest little farm. And if they would have given up at that point and start spraying, we wouldn't have had this amazing example. I want to thank you so much, Phil, for, for your time. I want to be conscious of your time, make sure we end on time. And thank you for your amazing work and hope to check in and see what kind of investments you've made and how you've put money to work to restore soil, people and ecosystems. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure talking to you and uh, I can't wait to see this momentum continue. It's, uh, it's good hold that it's got so far. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course investing in regenerative agriculture and food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees and what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you, if this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, 
plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, and what kind of co-investors you could find, or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soil builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design, and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.